book. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Now, this group are the Associate Continuing Healthcare Practitioners. However, you're also doing your Assistant Practitioner Level 5 as well. So you're, you're the group that was the splinter group. So just to let you know, your diplomas are being audited on the 10th of June by the EQA. So by roughly the 11th or 12th, I'll get some feedback and then I can let you know about those certificates. And that's the diploma bit done from the previous qualification, okay? So we're gonna park that because this is now about your apprenticeship, which is the Associate Continuing Healthcare Practitioner, which is this one that you have all been on and working towards. Now, just to remind you that uh, most of you now have finished all of this and I can see you've all gone through, you've all done your duties and skills and you've all got your feedback. How have you found it? Relatively straightforward? Is there anything confusing about it? So this is about preparing somebody for a continuing healthcare assessment. Anyone? Well, I personally did enjoy it uh, since my previous one was a team leader role. This to me was completely new and without... I would say mostly without all the other bits that are in uh, different courses. So yeah. to say like, you, you know, those basic ones, you know, personal cares and yeah. towards people. Yeah. This was more about the things that we, that we are actually learning. So I did enjoy that and I did learn a lot. Good. And I think what's important with this one, everything that you have learned to date, so your whole career in health and social care leads you up to being this person that is able to assess people's needs from a healthcare point and a mental health point. So, so physical health and mental health. And the aim of this apprenticeship is that you are able to recognise when somebody is entitled to that advanced continuing healthcare pathway and when they're entitled to that fast track pathway for kind of end of life. So it's about making sure that your patients are getting the right assessments and being referred at the right times. And as we go through the 10 duties, just to remind you of this, preparing you for your EPA. So in duty one, you have to undertake and manage and review the individual care packages. Now, you can all do that. You can all write care plans. You can all review care plans. You all know how to read a care plan because I've seen you do it. Yeah, happy with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Duty two then is about contributing towards planning for care. And planning for care and contributing towards that is all about making sure that you've assessed the patient's needs, making sure that you've got the up-to-date assessments, making sure that you've got the right medication, the right movement and handling assessments, the right behaviour plans, the right equipment, and the fact that you've done the right referrals. So that might be for SALT and diabetes and speech and language, whatever it is, it's really making sure that when you review that care package, all of the right components are in place. So again, I'm hoping that you're all experts at that now because you've been doing this for a couple of years. Duty three then is where it does start to alter and spin off into this framework for funding. And this is where you need to contribute towards a healthcare assessment. Now, hopefully you will have read the documents, you will have watched the videos that I've done. And if you haven't, go back, refresh them, they were the videos that I did on how to complete that paperwork and it was how to fill in those charts. Do you remember the ABC charts? So you kind of got a lot of respiration. Is it A this? Is it B this? Is it C this? Tick the box and then you write your comments. So you don't have to be leading this, but you have to be contributing towards it. So when the endpoint examiner rings you up, um, I want to say it's steadfast is the EPA because it's the only one in the country that's doing it. 
they will arrange this with you and say, right, OK, do you have any patients in which needs uh, a, um, a framework assessment? So ideally, you now need to be thinking about your patients and your EPA is probably going to be about July, August time for this. You've still got a bit of time. Um, so think about patients that potentially could be deteriorating in the next three to six months. And then those are going to be the patients that you're going to say, well, I've got this patient. I'm going to get consent that I can do this assessment on them. And then you're going to do the assessment. Yeah. So it's up yeah. to you to pick the right patient and seek consent and all of that stuff that goes around it. Again, you have my number on WhatsApp. What I highly recommend you do, once you've picked your patient, do a mock assessment. Go through the paperwork and fill it all in and then email it to me and go, look, Steve, does this look right? Actually, I don't know if I can say that in the recording because this has been recorded probably too late now because I've said it, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oops. Um, think about it because what I will do, I will pretend to be that, person sitting there challenging you so i will say look this doesn't meet this criteria and it's going to be down to you to tell me why it does yeah does this make sense if you tick a for example needs lots of support with breathing i'm going to be asking you well why why do they need lots of support with breathing what is it that makes that tick box an a and you're going to be saying to me, well, look at their medical history. They've got asthma, COPD, they've got pneumonia, whatever it is. You know, so it's, you're not going to have to make any of this up. You've got, you're going to know your patient and you're going to know all the history about your patient. So it's just down to you to fill in those boxes on that check sheet. Yeah. Happy with this? Yes. Good. Duty. Sorry. For, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just to ask you, is this available for end of life ones as well, or this is not applicable for end of life? Yeah, yeah. So if you do end of life, it will be the fast track form. Okay. So if they're end of life, you're going to be referring them for the fast track assessment because obviously by the time you've done your paperwork, they'll have probably mm -hmm. passed away um, and then you won't need the funding. Um, so. Fast track one way, your continued health care is the other. I don't know what the examiner will say. That's the problem. I don't know. So what I would suggest you do is pick one that maybe isn't end of life, but maybe maybe end of life. Yeah. Let, let's not forget, end of life is, would you be surprised if they pass away in the next 12 months? That's the criteria for end of life, right? Yeah. Um, so obviously, uh, duty for them is supervised staff in accordance with policies and procedures. So you're all in mentorship roles. You've all you've all done your care certificate assessors training. So you can all assess junior staff. You can all assess, um, you know, those inductions, and you've all done that, haven't you? You've all supported a member of staff. Good. Right, number five. You need to manage the continuing healthcare referral process. So before the EPA comes up, you will have already needed to put the notification in. So you need to think about who it is. And almost a month before, put the paperwork in, if that makes sense, because by the time this meeting gets arranged with the continuing healthcare team, they're not very quick, are they? No. No. So it might be the case that, and, and again, if you miss that window of opportunity and you have to redo it, then you just have to redo it It because it, we can't predict timeframes on when people may or may not pass away, etc. But you managing that referral process is that you are the one that instigates the report. You're the one that says, I think this person needs the help. You're the one that's talking to the family. You're notifying the family and just saying, look, we're going to do a referral because we think mum, dad is entering some stages where they need more care. Not the end of life, but they need more care. Uh, so we're going to try for the, the continuing healthcare funding. Now, let's face it, 
I don't think I know anyone so far this year that has managed to achieve that funding unless it's fast track. But that's not to say we shouldn't try because everyone has the right to the funding. We just may not be able to get it. Uh, but at least you understand the process. So you'll, and, and again, don't forget, you may have to get the doctor's reports. You may have to get a report from speech and language. You may have to get a report from the dietitian. Whatever it is, you know, wh wh whatever your evidence is, is what you're going to have to prepare for that meeting. If that makes sense. Yeah. Hopefully I've not lost anyone so far. Duty six then is you're then going to collate all of that evidence and document it. You're just going to put it together. You just now put it in your report and you're going to fill in those boxes and you're going to say, look, um, Mr. Smith, I ticked C for respiration because C medical report from doctor. He's got a 10 year history of lung problems. C diagnosis from cancer clinic. He's got stage four lung cancer. That's your evidence that you're supporting what you're saying. And again, if you haven't got that clinical evidence, then it's going to be your observational evidence, isn't it? It's going to be your care records. So if you can't get a medical report, if you can't get the medical report, then as a care team, the best you can do is pull off your care records from your computer systems. However, when we think about care notes, how many staff will be writing in such a way as, oh, Mr. Jones was really distressed in breathing today. He wasn't able to complete a task. Normally they go, wash, dress, fed, happy, left in chair, safe. Um, they're not really reporting on the clinical evidence that you're going to need. So when we think about the evidence, again, you'll have time to talk to the carers that are looking after this service user. And you can say to those carers, look, we're claiming funding for this gentleman or this lady because we think whatever it is. And therefore, I need you to document every time you see them struggling or out of breath or because unless they're reporting that, where would the evidence come from? Does that make sense? So it really is the case of you looking at the evidence in which you're going to submit for this person. And if it's not strong enough. You have to go back to that evidence and go, how can I get more evidence? How can I tighten this up? Yeah. Based on whatever you've scored. Because that scoring is low, medium and high risk, isn't it? Low, medium, and high, ABC. Good. Um, so number seven then is coordinate and guide the multidisciplinary team uh, to undertake the assessments. So again, that's just knowing so let's just say you've got your gentleman um, and he's diabetic. Well, part of your multidisciplinary team will be the diabetes nurse who's coming in and managing this. So what do they see? What are they noticing? Um, you may have the end of life team and the Macmillan nurses coming in doing the end of life drugs, or you may have a nurse doing that, depends on who it is uh, that's there. Um, number eight then is you need to resolve um, any uh funding problems so contribute to the resolutions of disputed el eligibility so what will happen is once you've completed your assessment it gets reviewed right and there's an outcome it either gets approved here's your additional funding for care or it's going to get rejected if it gets approved no one's probably going to be complaining about that um, however, they may say, actually, no, I have known somebody to complain because they didn't get enough. So they only got like a medium amount of funding rather than the top up funding. So it's down to you to then talk to the patient and the family about the appeals process. But in all of the paper that I've given you, we tell you how to raise the appeal. And it's in the national guidance, right? It's in there. It tells you how to raise that appeal. Um, so just make sure you know how to um, promote the service user and family to make a complaint and how to make an appeal against the decision. 
Um, duty nine then is about contributing to the commission services required to meet the individual's health needs um, as uh, presented by the multidisciplinary team. So that's you then working together, writing the care plans, making sure the right resources are there. And then duty 10 then is monitoring the contribution of health. So looking at those budgets nationally and understand about the different budgets. So if somebody asks you about, you know, what are the different health budgets, then hopefully you'll know about the nursing budgets, you'll know about the social care funding under the Care Act. There's obviously direct payments. There's obviously self-funding. So you just need to be aware of the different funding strands because what tends to happen, and I don't know whether any of you have experienced this in your roles, you'll have a nurse go, no, we can't pay for that. That's a social care thing. And then you'll have social care say, no, we can't pay for that. That's a health care thing. So really knowing where your budgets come from, the pots of fund that pay for care is really important. OK, any questions about those 10 duties? So do we need to do this for one patient or more? Yeah, so, so the, the end exam, we'll now run through the exam. So the exam, the end exam is here. So your gateway requirements, just so you're all aware, is I have to put together um, a portfolio for you, okay? So your portfolio will come from here. It's all of the evidence that you have submitted. OK, so what I will do when we put you through to Gateway, I will download all of your assignments and put it together as one folder for you. So you then have a copy of all of the work that you've submitted. And what will happen is the first assessment is they're going to have a discussion with you based on your portfolio. So as long as you know what you've written and you're going to have a hard copy, you're allowed it. Look, it says here the format of the structure of the portfolio needs to be agreed with the employer and the apprentice, e.g. a hard copy or online. So you're, you're allowed that. There must be at least one piece of information relating to each knowledge, skill and behaviour. So each of those assessments you've done, they meet the skills, knowledge and behaviour. So that's why we've done it. Yep, so we know that that portfolio, you don't have to do anything for that portfolio, it's done for you. It's the work you've submitted. Just be mindful that it says here that it's roughly between 20, 15 and 25 pieces of evidence. So that's all the work you've submitted. And actually you've done two pieces of work per duty, so you're there, right? So don't worry about that. Now, so you're going to have discussion based on that. And then the second thing is then this observation. And the observation is here. It says you will be observed over a total of two and a half hours with at least two hours for the observation and 30 minutes for questioning. And you will be observed running a multi -dis You'll be observed running that assessment. So that's why you need to arrange it, because you need to make sure that you're covering this. And remember, you've gone through the decision support tool. That's the box that says ABC. You remember that box, respiration, breathing, ABC. So that's what your observation is going to be on. Uh, again, you'll have the material there. So there's nothing to worry about. And then you're going to have your professional discussion. And your professional discussion will be based upon the portfolio of evidence. OK, now, as we go down to the bottom, it tells us exactly what you're going to be observed against. So here it is either a pass or a fail. OK, so to get a pass, that's all you need to do there. You need to demonstrate the behaviours expected as an associate within healthcare practitioner. So making sure you're organised, prepared, on time. You need to demonstrate practice in line with legislation. So you need to understand the paperwork and how to fill it in. You need to demonstrate a personal centred approach, which you can all do that. I've seen you all do that. You need to demonstrate appropriate use of risk assessments because that's going to form some of your evidence, isn't it? The risk assessments. 
You need to demonstrate various communication methods where you're going to communicate in their preferred style, the accessible information standards. You're going to demonstrate courage and transparency. So courage is you fighting for what's right for that individual. You go in, Mr. Smith is entitled to this funding because. And when somebody says no to you, oh, no, they're not going to get the funding. Your courage is, now hang on a minute, he's entitled to this funding, so we're going to fight for it. That's what courage is. Not just going to, oh, well, thanks a lot then. Yeah, no, all right then. We'll just <laughs> let him go without. Um, so courage is fighting for that. Transparency is about being honest to the patient at the beginning of the assessment and at the end of the assessment. That's transparency. And your duty of candor is if something goes wrong, just apologising about it. Because, again, there's so much that can go wrong in these things. Somebody hasn't turned up. The paperwork's been rejected. You didn't write enough in a box. Do you know what I mean? It's human systems. Um, you need to demonstrate that you're able to read and understand clinical records. Well, that's where you're going to get your evidence from, your care records. You're going to demonstrate your leadership and coordination skills. Um, and you're going to demonstrate professional relationships. So really, when we look at that, that's not too terrible. I think that's a relatively straightforward observation there. Yeah. And we can see here it's referenced to the skills, knowledge and behaviours. So those reference to these. So when we say, when we see K25 and S23, it's referring to this. K25, understand relevant legal information. So that might be your safeguarding, your prevent, your whistleblowing. That may be your multidisciplinary work and sharing of information, consent, capacity. Could be any of those things. It's whatever's relevant to your person, right? And then S23 is this one, act in accordance with legislation. So in other words, you're following the laws. So if you really want to write a plan and be prepared, it's page 10 of your assessment guide, okay? And the professional discussion, so you can be prepared for your professional discussion. So the difference between the OBS, the observation is either a pass or a fail. There's no other grade, okay, it's pass or fail. The professional discussion is fail, pass, or distinction. I'd, it'd be nice for you all to get the distinction. However, I'd be quite happy with you all just passing. But if you want the grades, they are here. So look, it says demonstrate the behaviours expected as an associate continuing healthcare practitioner. And you can see here it says B34789. So if we go here, B three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, have courage to speak up, be reliable and committed. So these are just what you should be doing, right? This is just you as a member of staff. So you don't really have to do anything there, or at least I don't think you do. Um, and then here, discuss how the principles and accountabilities apply to the role of the continuing healthcare practitioner. And you're going to be asked a question because there's the question. It's got to ask you because it's in the assessment. That will be the question you're going to be asked. So if you look at K19, what you're going to be asked is understand the principles of accountability and how this applies to your role as a continuing healthcare practitioner. So your role has got to be to be honest, transparent, you know, somebody that keeps it all together, that maintains confidentiality, good at record keeping, you know, just explain your role, what it is you do. You're an advocate for this person that you're trying to get this funding for, right? That's your role. But if you want to get the distinction for that question, you have to identify what impacts could be on themselves to the wider team and the individuals where to work outside the limits of your own competency and training. So if you then carry on to say, but you know what, I'm only trained as a level five, I'm not a trained nurse, 
because I would expect a trained nurse to or to be able to do a nursing diagnosis. I would expect the doctor to be able to do this. I can't do that. So it's very frustrating for me if I'm managing a client and I haven't got that skill set. You know, so let's say, for example, the patient you're talking about has got stage four lung cancer. You are not specialist nurses, are you? So you would then be reliant upon your specialist nurse giving you that information for that care plan. So that would then be an example of you working outside your limits to try and so you could then say, look, to try and advocate this person, I would work with Macmillan, I would do X, Y, Z. Or you may also want to then go on and sound like Florence Nightingale and just say, I'll, I'll do my own research. I mean, how many of you, well, all of you have gone on and done research? You've all written an essay. You've all gone on and done extended research in, so you know how to find an answer. Yeah. So you might just use that as the example. Happy with that? So with this document here, you could pretty much prepare your notes for this exam. Now you won't be allowed to take the notes in with you, but what you are allowed with you is your portfolio. And in your portfolio, you will have already answered this. So in one of your questions, I'm sure, if we look at one of the questions, uh, it's got to be one of the last assignments, right? It's got to be, because that's K-19. It's got to be down here somewhere. Uh, budget, it's multidisciplinary team. There you go, look. So if we look at this essay that you will have done here, there, it may just be that within your answer, you might just want to put like a little sideline to answer that question in full so in your portfolio you can then reference where these answers are does that make sense am i confusing anyone so when i give you your answers back when i give you all your coursework back your coursework has been designed so that's duty nine. So if we go to duty nine up here, so if we look at duty nine, duty nine covers all of that. So if you then saw that there, you would then know. So let's look for K-19, K-19. Claire, can we see K-19? It'll be on one of these, da, 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 there. So duty eight, sorry. So look, duty eight covers K-19. So if you then went to duty a essay that you have written, you will find that that will answer that. But if you want the distinction grade, you may have to add a bit more into your portfolio. Does that make sense? So we are allowed to edit our essays? Well, um, um... <laughs> That's a, that's a very good question. I think once it's submitted, that is the submitted work to the examiner. Okay. However, on your side, you may choose to write a little bit more to help you interpret what you've already written. Okay, yes. Yes, because it may be the fact that, because ultimately when you wrote your essays, you wrote them in line with the duty, because it was... Here's the duty. This is what you've got to answer. Answer it. Mm -hmm. And you've all answered it at the pass mark. Because we don't grade formative work. We just mark it to yes, let's make the standards. So if you want the distinction grade, all I'm saying is you need to go back over your essay, find where K19 sits, here, so K19, so we'd go back to the duties. We can see K19 is in duty eight. We can go to our duty eight assignment. So here we can go to our duty eight uh, knowledge assignment. And here we could then just add a bit more in, etc. Yeah, just so, because remember, you want it written in your language. 
How you've written these essays is I've structured you into academic writing. Now what you might want to do is just put it in your own words. Yeah, because you're not going to lose marks. You're not going to gain marks for talking in Latin. So don't bother talking in Latin. <laughs> just talk so you understand what you're saying. Does that make sense? You don't need to make it complicated on yourselves. So what I would do if I were you, I would go back over the essays that you've submitted with this document. And again, I'll email this out so you've all got this with the video. I would just go over with what I have submitted and then put it now in my own way. Yeah, so you don't get confused. Because again, with different levels of English and understanding and examples, don't don't make it hard on yourselves. Yeah. So I don't think there's any rule in that. Because the examiner, I don't think will see, because this is done remotely. So you'll do this over Zoom, I think. So they're not going to see your notes in front of you. They'll ask to see, you know, have you got your notes? And you can show them the notes as if it's the same as yours. If you've handwritten over your notes, that's entirely up to you. Because I do that, right? So when you look at this, actually, it's not really a massive amount. When you think how much, when you did those professional discussions with me, that's not a lot of things to discuss. Literally, accountability Infection control, we can all talk about infection control, what the framework's lines are, demonstrate how you do a personal centered approach. So again, what you do in your own service. So what you could do, you could answer this if you like, as a set of short written questions and email it to me and say, look, Steve, does that look right? But if I've already marked your essays, you've already shown me that you know the answer because that's what the essays were written on, yeah? Um, and then that's it. So it literally is the case of, once you've done that observation and your professional discussion, if you fail the observation, you obviously fail because you have to pass the observation. Uh, you can only pass the obs, that's neither here nor there. If you get a distinction on the professional discussion, then you get an overall distinction. So the distinction grade, and I think this is an easy win for a distinction, the distinction grade is not on the observation, it is only on the professional discussion. So that's pretty cool, right? The fact that actually it's not on writing, it's not on the exam, it's not on what you're gonna be able to do, it's just on what you know. So, that's the distinction grades there. So just go through that. And, you know, if you want that distinction, I think this is an easy win distinction for you people. You know, it's not like the the other AP, you have to get a distinction across three of the four areas. This one, you've only got to get it in one area to get an overall distinction. Yeah, so it's quite nice if you want that. Um, but obviously, if you pass it, you just get an overall pass. So the whole weighting is on that discussion. Yeah. And that discussion is, again, I think it's not that long. Let me just see what the timing's worth for that discussion. Component two, professional discussion. So at least 90 minutes. Most of you, you've been on the phone to me for hours at some point throughout the last two years, and we've been talking for hours. So 90 minutes is nothing, right? Um, you're going to have your work to refer to as well. So again, you can reference it up and say, well, if you look at page two, I've already answered that, for example, and this is what I do and this is how I do it. Yeah, happy with that? So... Yeah. Is this online or face-to-face? -face? Um, the whole lot, I think, is going to be remote. Yeah. Even the observation. In, including the observation, I think. Um, they're trying, they were trying to change it because it, it's just not appropriate 
for an outsider to be sitting in on something so confidential. You know, it's not fair on that person. It's another person in a room kind of thing. Um, and with multidisciplinary teams, a lot of the multidisciplinary teams now are all online. So, you know, if you need to get your social worker and a doctor and a nurse together, it's unlikely they're all going to turn up to your venue. So you'll probably be doing it online. Yeah. So basically we create a Zoom meeting. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, you create the meeting. Uh, and again, in line with whatever your home does. Um, but... Just bear in mind, they may turn and say, yeah, no, we've got to come to your place of work. However, um, the last time I spoke to the director of the EPA, he was very much, they were looking to change that because it just wasn't appropriate. And especially for an end of life pathway, nobody wants, you know, you know it, it, it really is about the appropriateness of an examiner sitting there watching you assess an end of life pathway assessment. Is that right? Is it, does it feel morally correct? And I don't think, I don't think it will sit well with a lot of people. Um, and ultimately I think your employers would find that difficult to agree as well. Because again, you need the consent from family and service users, etc. Yeah, happy with that. So, basically, if you now, so to get through to your gateways, to get through to gateway, we've got a month or so where we just need to make sure you have finished off all of your assignments. So if you've got any outstanding assignments, just make sure you log in and get those done by the end of this month. OK, because what I want to be able to do at the end of this month, I will download. Um, Dane, are you OK for me to show your file? Yeah, fine. Yeah, it's got all your work in it and stuff. I don't just let's just just because I know you've completed. That's all. Um, blah, 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 blah. Well, at least now you've given me a peace of mind that I actually have completed. <laughs> yeah. So here. So basically, if we go to grades. Um, I've got all of these here. So this is what it looks like from my side. So I can see all of your duties. You've got all of my comments and feedbacks there. And then what I will do, we print this out and submit it. OK, so this is what your portfolio will look like. You basically have that as your cover page with all your assignments. And then these are hyperlinks to the assignment. So when you left click to it, it takes you to the assignment. Uh, so then you can then go back over the assignments. You can have a look at everything. So remember, if you did short written questions, these will be written in line with the duties. Um, so like, for example, if you look at duty one, it was like, what's the principles of anatomy and physiology or something? You know, pump blood through the body. Um, and then you had your skills, which is these ones, the knowledge. So these are what's all referenced up. So, um, and then if we download submissions, I think I can, I haven't done it yet. I've probably now just set my computer into a meltdown. No, I can't, I can't do it yet. But anyway, what will happen is, I think you can log into your portfolios though, right? You can see your work, your side, what you've submitted. Yeah. Um, Why won't that let me? Oh, I think I have to click on your, there we be. You're the first group that I'm sending through this way. So let's go back. Uh, um, there. So here, that was the case study there. There you go, there's the case studies. So again, all we will do, we will download that Ah, there you go. There's your work. So this will be your portfolio. And all you've got to do then is you can decide if you want to add more to it or not add to it. Um, so 
And again, I've written quite a lot in my feedback to you all, haven't I? So like in the feedback, I've almost given you additional answers because it's formative and not summative assessment. So you will find in there that you've got all of the answers that you need, okay? Um, and I can't create those portfolios for you unless you've finished all of the assignments. So as we go through, we just need to make sure that they're all done. And most of you, I think, have done. Karina, you've just got a little bit left to do there. So not much. You've, you've almost all done. So just log in and see what you've got left. Okay. Um, and then finally, it's then if you need to do your functional skills, maths and English, we need to have those done by the beginning of July at the latest. So if you need to do maths and English, um, Pat has been reaching out to you to do the speaking and listening. Um, I think actually you, you've attended, haven't you, this group? I've done. Yeah, I've you've done. done. So now it's just the... Um, any outstanding exam, so I'll book you in for those. Because I if can't. I needed, if I needed to do functional skills, would they have got in touch with me? Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. If you needed to have done it, you'll have been logged on already onto the oh. functional skills classes. So functional skills are not in your portfolio when you log into Canvas, then you don't need to do them. Okay. Um, but what we what we should have had from you is your certificates, and if they're on record, because when we when we say to the EPA, which is the endpoint assessment, you're ready for gateway, we have to submit your English and math certificate and this portfolio of evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I sent them to Sue. So should I send them to you? Uh, if, yeah, if Sue, if you send them to Sue, we will have them. They'll be on record. Yeah, so, so don't worry about that. Yeah, they'll be on record. Now, the, the other thing is, so... You guys, let me just, when did you start this? Because I don't want to, I want to say it's about a year ago now, wasn't it? Mm. When well, we did the swap over. Let's just have a look. Um, student grade, on a student access report. Give me one second. Mine might not be accurate and in line with everyone else's because I think I jumped in about two months later than everyone else. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's have a look. It's only a rough a guesstimate because we had that problem where we swapped you all over, didn't we? Because you guys were with for um, that other company that then did that silly bugger thing. Um, okay, so... Yeah, aspire to learn, yeah? Yeah, that was it. So let's just scroll down. How much logging in you've done? See, these are all the records that the computer just stores everything you've done, every page you've been on. Right, so it was June last year you started. So yeah. some of you might have been a month or two before that. And this is a 12-month program, so we are bringing you in roughly 12 months early for you, Wolf. Um, and I think I was told we can bring you in no sooner than 12 months on program um, because we've got a reason why we're fast-tracking you, because you were all disadvantaged from the first time round. So that's why you're not doing it as a 12-month 24 month program. Yeah. Good. So fingers crossed. Go online, have a look, make sure everything's filled in. You'll get your portfolios downloaded and emailed to you by the end of the month. You're going to have a look at this document, page 10, I think, and 11 it was, wasn't it, for the professional discussion and observations which tells you, so page 10 is the observation, page 11 is the professional discussion. And all you're going to do is reference your portfolio to this to make sure that you can answer those questions. Yeah. And if you can't find the answer in your portfolio, then you need to add it because you don't want to get stuck on the day where you then need to answer a question about something you don't know because you know exactly what's going to be asked it's here. 
So they can't ask you anything that's not on that list, which is quite nice, really, right? So no, no nasty surprises. Um, so that's that. Uh, and just so you remember, just in case some of you didn't do it, just so you remember, on here, under announcements, this is what you must know. There's your fast track tool, your checklist, and your guidance. It's there. Yeah. And if you go to the YouTube channel, we go to playlists. And we go to Associate Continuing Healthcare. Hello, and you've got all the lessons there, but here I have given you the step by step guide on how to complete. Hi, everybody, welcome to this session. <clears throat> um, I sound squeaky there for some reason. Um, so you've got the how-to video on how to fill in that paperwork there. And I go through all of that paperwork with you and how to fill it in and what to do. And remember, I gave you examples of how to use AI technology to help fill stuff in. And then you've got your pathway tools there as well. Hi, everyone. Welcome to... Yeah, so it may just be the case of refreshing you. So your minds about how to fill in that paperwork. But if you go to your announcements, look at OSCE practical session, which is um, the structured exam. This is, this is all it is. It's this here. So just download those documents, become familiar with them. If you want me to look at anything beforehand, if you want to fill it in, if you want to give me your case study, if you want to, you know, what I would do if I were you, I would pick a person, fill in the paperwork, email it to me and say, Steve, is this right? And use it as a mock. You know, find a patient and just run through the process so you're comfortable. So on the day you're not going to trip up. You're not going to find anything difficult. You will have done it. Yeah. If you haven't done them already, I know some of you in your previous roles have done a lot of them. So especially if you were on those night shifts with the nurse that used to do them. So if you've done them, you don't need to worry about it. But if you want to go through it, it's there. All right. Any questions? Nope. All clear? Okay. It's an odd question. Yeah. But it's like in the setting where I am, there's either end of life or quite independent people. Yeah. With full capacity. Yeah. So in this case, I would obviously try to write about somebody who is on the end of life. Yeah. What if they pass away? What I've already started. Yeah, so, so basically, if you start with somebody in the exam process, so let's say the examiner rings you up and he gives you a three to four week window to prepare everything yeah. and the patient dies, then obviously you just need to ring them up and say, look, I'm really sorry that patient's passed away. We're going to have to look at another patient. Okay. Yeah, because again, it's real. The, you know, the whole point of this is it's real. Mm. Um you, you know, and, and let's face it, it may be the case that what you need to do is find somebody that potentially is going to become unwell and need assistance in the future. So just because they're not unwell now, maybe they just get an early diagnosis or something. Maybe you've got somebody, uh, if you're in residential care, you think, oh, you know, you're getting a bit more complex. Because because the, the, the idea of the normal pathway is that we're assessing needs for the future. Okay. Um, so just become familiar with the decision-making tool, the support decision-making tool, uh, which is the checklist. So if you look at the checklist tool, 
and we scroll down to the bottom. So there's your continuing needs checklist. So this is what you should be filling in. So here, do you remember we said it's, it's C, B or A? And it tells you what it is. It's not like you have to make it up. And here is where you're going to put your evidence. So it may be the case that you've got somebody who has a history of winter being really difficult for breathing for them because they always get pneumonia or flu or something. So at the moment, they're not, it's not a problem, but actually you're preparing for winter. Okay. It will probably get rejected and somebody might go, no. <laughs> um, you know, worst case scenario, you know, you, you might have somebody that's losing a lot of weight, so therefore they're not eating and drinking well, but they normally bounce back. I mean, it, it, it could be anything on anyone. Yeah. Um. Uh, and, and also just because they're well-ish doesn't mean that they're not going to deteriorate. So it's difficult because what you'll probably find is your end of life, they may not even accept the end of life as end of life. You may have to do kind of like the end of life as a continued health care. Um, because remember, end of life is we just think they may pass in the next 12 months, mm. where your end of life might be in the next few weeks. Um, so you need to be catching it 12 months before it happens. But equally, you know, if you've got somebody with peg feeding, if you've got somebody who's a neck breather, if you've got somebody who's constantly incontinent and, and you know, lots of skin problems and they've got poor mobility and poor communication and poor mental health you're probably gonna be ticking bees all the way through that list right yeah so it may be the fact that actually you've got people that you don't think meet it that then do meet it so that's your paperwork that's what all what we're asking you to do is fill this paperwork in on somebody um and you know, if you're going to do a mock person, make sure it is a person that you know, because I will challenge you like the examiner. So if it were the observation, I will then challenge you as, and I will be as difficult as I can be. So if you tick A, in this box here, you best explain why you've ticked A. <laughs> And if you can't then answer why you've ticked A, I'm going to push you to, to tell me why you've ticked A. Because it should be that clear. And the reason continuing healthcare assessments don't pass is because they're poorly filled in and poorly evidenced. You know, you've got nurses just ticking boxes because they're so bloody busy, but they're not actually providing the evidence or the clinical evidence that says why you've ticked that box. And it may be the fact that you tick a box, you know, okay, so yes, look, they're, they're breathless due to a condition. Well, then thinking about your medical report or your medical evidence, what is it you're going to want? Maybe you need to do a referral to the respiratory clinic. You know, maybe, you know, I think about an example, my dad, for example, he's got a respiratory problem. He's been diagnosed or not diagnosed with COPD, but it's on his record that he has COPD. So in his nursing assessment, they tick that he's got COPD, but he's never had a diagnosis for it. So where has that decision come from? Because actually there is no medical decision that he's got COPD. Even though his oxygen levels are at 85, he brings up lots of sputum, he's unable to walk, you know, short distances of 25 meters, so without that diagnosis, it's going to be bounced back, isn't it? So part of my role would then be to go, well, OK, it says this, but where's the evidence? And let's face it, how many of us have got dementia patients where we've gone, that's dementia. Everyone's called it dementia, but nobody's done the assessment. Mm -hmm. So again, that's going to be your right this is what i'm doing this is what i'm doing this is what i'm doing because that's the courage bit i have to push this forward yeah happy with that 
Lovely. Right. Well, on that note, I shall let you all go. Have a fantastic afternoon. I'm going to email this out to you shortly with the, those links. Please log on. Please get everything up to date. And then let's get you guys certificated off my books. And you'll never have to listen to my squeaky voice again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You really all shouldn't have laughed. That's really hurt my feelings. <laughs> okay. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.